Uh, we've had two polls that have shown a considerable drop for the Labour Party, both the Roy Morgan poll and that was preceded the News Hub poll have showed a considerable drop in support for Jacinda Ardern's Labour Party. And Jacinda Ardern said that uh, she's not concerned about those polls. And that's just the arrogance of them showing through. What we've seen though is that the ACT Party has managed to hoover up um, a good amount of support. But also there's 3.5% support there for New Zealand First slash Winston Peters as well. Which means that he's on the cusp, two years out from an election, of being re-elected. Um, it doesn't take much to get to 5%. He just needs to peel off another one5 to 2% uh, from the Labour Party, which he'd be easily able to do, especially if he comes out and says to people, you know, makes a pitch that, um, you know, do you mi are you missing the handbrake yet? That's all he needs to do, really. And with the extent of the stupidity that's going on with this government at the moment, it's a valid argument to make, and he could easily peel off 2% from the Labour Party just on that pitch alone. I think ACT is probably topped out. Maybe they'll eke another 1% out, but where they're getting their votes from is from the right wing of the National Party. And so the next group of block of votes that will split off will be those centre voters that are looking for an alternative government, and that's when National will cash in. So that's my view on where we're at at the moment with the polls. No, I don't believe they can. Um, there's a thing in government called inertia. It's the same as, as getting listeners to change from listening to news talk ZB to listening to another radio station. The inertia of the audience uh, won't move. And in politics, it's different. It's that if you make a, a policy change today, you won't see the effects of that policy change for at least two years. The Labour government's made huge policy changes, particularly around housing, around child poverty, and all of those indicators have got worse for the government, not better, despite their changes. And so anything they do today to try and arrest that decline in the polls is not going to bear fruit in time for the election. In actual fact, it'll probably get worse for them before the election. Now, I think they're on a, on a slide, and even now, if even just 2% fall, every couple of months um, by the wayside for the Labour Party, then they've got a real um, chance of being uh, tossed out. And bear in mind, in 2017, they became the government from second place. So you, National doesn't actually have to get in front of them, they just have to be you know, slightly behind them in second place. And the other parties like New Zealand First and ACT uh, will then support a change of government. I believe they are. They've basically chopped out all of the wet wing. Most of them lost their seats at the last election anyway. Um, what remains uh, are towing the party line. They learnt their lesson very, very badly at the hands of you know, Todd Muller and Matthew Hooten and the other apparatchiks that thought that they could govern the National Party from a position of standing in a puddle. It didn't work. Uh, just and Judith is, uh, has been, uh, you know, studiously um, uh, making sure that the team are firing. You're starting to get people like Nicola Willis getting real good hits on Megan Woods and housing. Um, you're seeing Chris Bishop starting to make inroads around discussions around the vaccine rollout and uh, all of those sorts of things. Uh, infrastructure is uh, in an appalling state, and we saw last night with the power brownouts that their energy policies are now in question. Uh, and you know, New Zealand is waking up to the fact that, that these policies sound great in, in, you know, as, a, as a sermon or, or as a, a bumper sticker slogan, but in reality it means that you've got no power, that you're shivering at home in cold. Uh, and do, if, you know, we're sitting on acres and acres and acres of of coal reserves in New Zealand. We've got some of the largest coal reserves in the world and we're importing millions of tonnes of Indonesian coal to fuel our power system and to, to cover the, the gaps. Uh, it doesn't make sense that we're importing coal when we could use our own. You know, I'm sure we could um, deploy uh, new technology that would make coal a lot cleaner. 
um, that would be a whole lot cheaper than trying to um, exist on you know fantasy dreamlands about wind power and solar power and, and all sorts of other nonsense about renewable power. Bottom line is, is everyone wants renewable, pow re renewable power until the power goes out. Well, there's never an election tomorrow, there's always an election campaign. Um, currently, Labour and Greens hold the poll position, but only barely. Uh, if there was an election campaign that started tomorrow, then I think you'd see a different outcome from what the polls show the position is today. Because Labour's got no successes that they can claim. They've run out of excuses now, they've been in power for four years. Uh, they can't uh, claim uh, that it's nine long years of neglect anymore. People just won't wear that. The COVID effect is worn off. People are frustrated. Businesses are still seriously recovering from the impact of the, of the lockdowns. And sure, it stopped COVID spreading in New Zealand, but I'm unsure as to whether COVID would have spread anyway because of the way that we live with separate dwellings and lots of space between us, huge rural population as well. Um, I'm not sure that you can compare places like Italy uh, to, to New Zealand. Maybe in parts of Auckland you could do that, but the rest of the country you can't. So I don't think that the government um, is standing on solid ground. I think that they think that COVID is the answer and they'll be desperately hoping there's a Delta variant outbreak that allows them to lock down and bring that fear back into the population so that the, the so-called sheeple, the, the, the dull-witted amongst us uh, who do everything that they're told to do will dutifully comply with dear leader as she speaks from the podium of truth. And the simple fact is, is that um, you know, we haven't had daily uh, brainwashing from Jacinda Ardern um, because we haven't had uh, uh, any more lockdowns or anything like that. So I think they're standing on very, very shaky ground. Uh, well, what it will look like and, and what I want are probably two slightly different things. I actually uh, am hoping that we end up with three similarly sized parties uh, being able to join together to form a coalition and I think that would show that MMP actually does work if we had say ACT and New Zealand First of about the same size and slightly behind national in terms of size. I think that MMP is a failure when there is one large party and one small party or even a couple of small parties but the large party can dominate using you know divide and conquer. I think if we had three evenly balanced parties forming a coalition that you would see um, a lot more stability and you wouldn't get these uh, radical lurches that we've been seeing and that's what I'd like to see. I think it'll be pretty close to that. I don't think you're going to see National at the uh, levels they had under John Key. Um, I think those were artificially high for, for unknown reasons really. I mean. If you look at the philosophical background of, of John Key, he really stood for nothing. Um, and if you asked anybody in the street what did John Key achieve, about the only thing they say is, oh, well, he you know, saw us through the global financial crisis. And I always reply to that, and you don't think Michael Cullen would have done the same thing? You know, so I don't think that John Key was that special. Uh, I've seen a lot of politicians in my life, and he certainly not special. Um, he certainly has no uh, core beliefs. He's basically a pole-driven fruitcake um, and he believed in his own uh, immortality politically and the only thing that saw that dented was uh, his insistence on pursuing a, a flag referendum. Uh, I told him to his face that it was going to fail. And uh, he told me that, no, no, I'll, I'll convince everybody, I'll talk about how great it'll be as a marketing strategy and it'll work. And I told him he was wrong. So I think Jacinda's in the same position. She thinks that she's uh, uh, immortal politically. She thinks that she can explain her way out of any of her particular problems that they're facing at the moment. Their non-delivery in housing, uh, their transport disasters, um, the failure of the, of the vaccine rollout, 
the abject failure in child poverty, um, they've got no wins. They've got nothing that they can take to the electorate. And now, whenever they make a big promise, like, for instance, the cycle bridge in Auckland Harbour, everyone's just going to laugh at them and say, well, how do we know you're not going to reverse that because it becomes unpopular? How do we know you're just not going to be able to deliver it? So, you know, I think uh, they've got huge problems in terms of credibility. Anyone who's, if they say we're going to promise to, to put rapid rail to Tauranga, everyone will laugh in their face. They haven't delivered a single thing. Even the train to, from Hamilton to Papakura is an abject failure. You know, I mean, you've got carriages parting ways on their 40 kilometer an hour trundle up the tracks. Uh, it takes two hours, it takes one hour to drive. So, you know, why would you take the train? It doesn't make sense. And nothing they do makes sense. I'm in line with what Bob Jones has said, and we published his article on, on our site. And he believes firmly that we're going to see a change of government at the next election. Now, what that makeup will be will depend on the, the election pitches that they make. But I think national is solidifying. You know, when you look at the polls, um, it always pays to look th through at the polls through the lens of the other team. So Jacinda Ardern's team are arrogantly sitting there on the high side of a... Think about polls as a, as a river, a stream, if you want, through the electorate. Uh, and you've got one party on one side and one party on the other side of the stream. Labour's on the high bank. And they're looking down at the low bank and seeing that the floodwaters have come through and, you know, nationals knee deep in a, in a bit of mud and stuff like that. And, but what they're not realising, they're not looking down at their own bank and they can't actually see their own bank from where they're standing. Whereas nationals looking back at, the, at them and seeing that that river, those poles, are actually undermining the, the, the bank that Labour is standing on. And every little bit of bad news chips away a little bit more of the bank and a little bit more of the bank and a little bit more of the bank. And then eventually you get a slump. Now we saw the start of that slump, 9%, over 9% in one poll. If they get another, you know, 2 or 3%, 4%, 5% slump in the next set of polls, you've got a real problem. And that bank has now collapsed underneath Labour and the chances of them being able to scramble back up onto dry ground are very slim indeed.